imagine a super tight election, a dead heat between the major parties and their coalition partners. One party holds a balance of power, but it's not Te Party Māori. It's a new party to Parliament, born from the Christchurch electorate of Islam. The leader of the Opportunities Party, or top, Raf Manji, believes he can win the seat. So what are his bottom lines? Raf Manji joins me now. Tenakwe, thanks for coming in. Thank you. All right, so this all comes down to winning the seat of Islam. Give me your pitch. Well, it's time for a fresh voice, a party with fresh ideas um, that's not left, that's not right, that's forward-looking and future-focused. And I think that's what the Opportunities Party is going to bring to Parliament. Right. Two percent of the polls. Mm. So it, it, it's all about the seat, really, and then who you can bring in with you. Yeah, look, I think so. I mean, I think five percent is a very tough ask for, you know, any small party, but particularly a party that hasn't been in Parliament before. Yeah. And so, yeah, we, we think we can get the party vote up as we get closer to the election, but Islam is our prime focus. OK, so you've had some success there before standing as an independent. You came second in 2017 behind Nationals' Jerry mm. Brownlee. So why join TOP? Is it just a political vehicle for you personally? Mm. No, I mean, Top approached me in 2017 when I was standing in Islam uh, and I met Gareth and I'd always been a fan of Gareth and the work that he'd done, particularly around universal basic income and also the approach that the Morgan Foundation took to policy and actually trying to solve problems. So they asked me if I would stand for them in 2017 and I said, look, no, because my pitch in 2017 was all about the post-earthquake situation. Yeah, so. so it was very, very focused. And of course, a lot of people outside Christchurch didn't understand that, but people in Christchurch did. Uh, in 2020, yeah, they asked me again, but I was- You said no? I was, I was still dealing with the 15th of March. Right. Issues. Okay. I, I just was not in that position, and yeah. Then in, in 2022, um, and you they said asked yes. me again. I said okay. <laughs> so they wore you down. I, after and, three... I, and I think the, the reason was is because, I mean, politics is hard, and and this is this is a this is a hard road. But I just felt that 2023 would need something new. I want to understand your political motivation because you moved here from London, mm. you, were, you know, worked in the capital markets here in the, yes. the London financial hub and you came to the provincial hub of Christchurch. Yes. Was that a, a culture shock when you came? No. It wasn't? Why no, and I'll tell you why. I first came to New Zealand in the mid-88 in mid as a backpacker. Right, OK, so, so you've been here before. So I've been here before. I had met um, a Kiwi girl travelling, okay. as you do, in Bangkok of all places, and I came down here and I just fell in love with the place. Right. Hitchhiked around the South Island, spent some time in Christchurch, and I thought, wow, it's kind of a little bit like England, in a way. <laughs> and, um, you know, then we were back in London and we had children and we were thinking, oh, you know, where do we want to bring them up? Mm. Okay. And we used to come to Christchurch on holiday, absolutely loved it, and it's been a fantastic place to live. So your political motivation, mm. do you actually have a political hero here that you're trying to emulate, or, or why are you doing it? Just in, in one sentence, Frankly, why are you doing it? Because we need better outcomes, and we okay. need to be prepared for the future. And that's something I'm interested in, I've got children, so I'm committed to that. Okay. Mm. A political hero, do you have one? Not really. Not really? No. OK. Right. Most, most people who stand <laughs> for politics are embedded and immersed in the political history and have a political yeah. hero. Is it strange that you don't have a political no, hero? I'm not a traditional politician. I'm a problem solver. So for me, it's a question, actually, how do we deliver the outcomes that people want? You know, we, we currently have a 18th century political system uh, which to me looks like it's on its last legs. Uh, we have an MMP system here which is stale which has been around for 27 years, and we need something different. I mean, OK, okay. I mean, if, if, if you think of an inspiration, Macron in France. Emmanuel Macron. So 2017, he came through the centre out of nowhere. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to do that, <laughs> but, but what happened is the traditional left and the traditional right parties in France basically collapsed. They stopped delivering So you're seeing the space people. in the centre for someone like... I think so. Like, now, okay. France and New Zealand are very different yeah, places. Absolutely. But what I'm saying is that I think there is time... It is time for something new, for something fresh. All right, let's talk Absolutely. about policy then. You've mm. got lots of big mm. picture policy, tax reform, all those kinds of things. But I want to talk about the Teal card. You yeah. brought it in today as well. Now, I didn't ask you Take to do that, people. but you, can, you can't resist a bit of branding, can you? Um, if I was under 30, this is an under 30s policy. So if I was under 30, I could be interested because it is 1500 bucks credit for an e-scooter. It yeah. is free public transport, free GP and dental visits, five grand towards training or KiwiSafe. But why such a youth targeted policy? Because we need to invest in our future generations. So essentially, this is a gold card for young people. Now, of course, if you're under 30, you should love this. But I've been handing this out to kids that mm -hmm. I see. I say, check this out. This is what you're going to get. 
as you grow up. But the funny thing is there are actually a lot of older people, parents, grandparents, who go, this is a great idea. We need to invest in our younger generations. We need to give them a sense of what the future might look like. Okay. The, the, the national civic service aspects of this, yeah, I know. social so cohesion, that's, so that's so people don't critical. know the policy, mm. you, get, you only get $5,000 mm. towards your training or KiwiSaver mm. if you complete a civics course, mm. which also costs you about five grand, mm. not, not you personally, but yeah. the government. Um, how likely is it? How likely are the kids going to want to do a civics course to get five grand? We'll find out. I mean, I think France. Well, well, so we so France, <laughs> France. I'm talking France again. So yeah. France is actually bringing in a compulsory national civic service model, which will actually be a year long. So you're just what, trying to get engagement in politics. It's a, it's a, it's yes, it's creating that sense of social cohesion. So the um, Centre for Informed Futures, a couple of days ago, released a report about social cohesion. Mm. Extremely worried about the issues in New Zealand. Sure, we're, we're seeing it. You know, okay. the gang stuff, the, the ram raids, the, the kids. We want we want all our kids to basically come into adult life with the right life skills, with a sense of purpose, um, and yeah, and we put in a little bit of financial support as well. Isn't this a risky policy? 500,000 under 30s voted last election. Mm. Have a total pool of 2.9 million votes. Yeah. Don't you need the older voters if you're going to get across the line, not only with the 5% threshold, but yeah. just in the, in the electorate? Yeah, it's not it's, just it's about voting. It's actually, what, what are the policies that we need? So this is... Yeah, but you've got to this, attract this, the other, uh, apart from the under 30s, you've got to yeah. attract the rest of the electorate to get yeah, you in. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, I mean, I mean, the interesting thing for me is when I look at my support in Ireland, a lot of that is from actually older people because okay. they voted for me on council. They saw what I did. They saw the type of person that I was, that I was a straight shooter, um, was able to solve problems for them. So I think this is, this is about the future of New Zealand okay. and we've all got a stake in it, whether you're young or old. Are you going to scare away the older voters with your other kinds of policies? Yep. You want to put in a land tax yes. so of 0.75% mm. on residential property. Yes. That will definitely scare off Kiwi homeowners who are so emotionally and financially mm. attached to the house. We have to rebalance the income housing relationship. We've been trying to do it for ages. I mean, Chris Bishop was on here a couple of weeks ago talking about it to you, uh, about sustained moderation. Ten years ago, Nick Smith was, you know, talking about this stuff mm. as well. And I mean, let me give you uh, some data. So, from December 2001 to 2021, uh, wages using the labour cost index rose 56%. In that same period, house prices rose 456%. I mean, this is untenable. I mean, when you talk to young people, it's like we can't afford a house. Right. So we have to rebalance it. Now, the way we're doing that is, yes, a small tax on urban residential land, on the land value, not the house value. Uh, and we but use no. it, we're using that to pay for income tax cuts. So we have an income tax-free threshold. But does it balance out for somebody? Do they get the same amount back from income yeah. tax cuts as they pay on yeah, their so land? Essentially, In your calculator that I've seen online, yes. it doesn't necessarily work out that way. Well, the, the numbers to think about, so a household income around $70,000 mm -hmm. and a house price of around $850,000 will be net-net, won't make a lot of difference. So right. for a lot of people, it'll be $1,000 here or there. But if you're renting, obviously not paying land value tax. Yep. So that's yep. quite a few people. Okay. Now, it's a much, if you're going to tax property, this is the best way to do it. You can have a capital gains tax. It doesn't actually incentivize the productive use of land. You can do what the Greens... So you, done be do you believe there is going to be an electoral appetite for a land tax? <sighs> Who knows? Uh, I mean, I think Labor, <laughs> Labor will probably come out with a couple of gains tax. Well, the, this is a serious question. Do it we is. want to rebalance this situation? And this is where young people will have to get involved and make their, you know, make their feelings known. And where older people go, actually, we have to do something about this. So whether it's a capital gains tax or a land value tax, we need or to do Or whether they're willing to give up an extra bit of money to, for, for the younger generation. Absolutely. Okay. Let's talk uh, one other mm. big policy. It's the universal basic income, mm. $16,500 for everyone, whether mm. you're working or not. Mm. Why do we need that? Well, we have got some huge societal shifts coming. Um, I mean, I did a talk in 2016, TEDx talk, talking about technology, the future of AI. It's here. Yeah. Now... That is going to disrupt the labour market in ways that we don't really understand yet. Now, there's a lot of debate whether it's a lot of jobs are going to disappear, yep. new jobs will be created, but we really don't know. Um, that's going to be a huge impact on the labour market. So, so the universal basic income provides flexibility. 
so it means that people can transition in and out of jobs, um, they can attempt to start businesses. There's also a huge gender component. I mean, it's extremely yeah. positive for women. So women. So you're do, talking about unpaid work. Yeah, yeah, women do most of the unpaid work, like around 75 percent of yeah. that. They're not getting, um, um, you know, okay. recompensed for that. Things like childcare. Um, there are a lot of benefits to it, but it's also economically much more efficient than the welfare system that we have at the moment. Okay. Yeah. All right, look, I'm going to run out of time soon. There's lots to talk about. Let's say you win Ireland, mm. okay? You hold the balance of power. Yeah. Your policies seem to skew left, so you're a natural yeah. fit for Labour and the Greens. Is that right? I think we skew centre. I mean, we're about progressive policy, but we're also focused on economic efficiency as well as environmental sustainability. We can work with both, both. sides can of you? the spectrum. All right. yeah, no problem. So uh, our approach is to go and sit on the cross benches. We're a new party. We're not going to overplay our hand, and we'll be happy to work with whoever the major parties are. Even if are. somebody offered you a bauble, okay, an associate minister of finance yeah. from either side, yeah. would you get into a, a coalition or some kind of agreement? No. No. But if somebody You're wants. To, if somebody wants to support one of our policies, so if someone says, hey, we will implement the teal card, well, that obviously would be of interest, yeah. Yeah, OK. Yeah. All right. Um, could you work with David Seymour? Sure. Winston Peters? Sure. OK, you can work with everybody. <laughs> All right. Um, is there a bottom line for you, one particular policy that would have to be uh, given to you in order for you to give somebody their, their support? Look, I think bottom lines are unhelpful, but what, what I would say is ultimately the people of Ireland are going to put us into Parliament. Uh, on Tuesday, I'll be revealing a Christchurch plan, mm -hmm. which will be my pitch to the people of Ireland. Uh, there'll be some policies in there that um, I will release, and certainly one of those will be a bottom line. Sure. Okay, so a bottom line coming on Tuesday. Yes. You're not going to tell us where it is now? Uh, no. Okay, all right. Um, I just finally, you were just mentioning to me to, before that you know, you're about technology and automation and the changing yeah. workforce, but you're also developing something called an AI candidate yes. for this election? Yes. This is not a real candidate. What is it? Well, it's an AI candidate. So essentially, uh, you know, everyone's aware of ChatGPT and the, uh, the incredible work and speed at which it can churn out answers and information. And we've been playing around a little bit with the idea of could you create an AI candidate? And as it happens, you can. So we have a candidate which is online at the moment, uh, but I am talking to, about, to somebody about whether we can actually develop that up into you know, a proper avatar, somebody that might be able to speak, answer questions, do interviews. And obviously it's a bit of fun because it wouldn't fit under the Electoral Act, but it could be a good demonstrator for actually what does the future of politics right. look like? I mean, if we think that 120 people sitting in this you know, 100-year-old room are going to be the best people to make decisions, then we might find in the future that AI so is going to be way smarter than us. Right, so there's no need for a ref Manji then? Who knows? I mean, we'll still need people to actually decide the outcomes that we want, but in terms of delivering the outcomes, yep. I mean, this is the thing. We have, <laughs> you know, tens of thousands of public servants shuffling paper around, writing strategy documents and all the rest of it. We may be able to do that way more efficiently. Right. OK, so uh, fascinating. Uh, Raf Manji, leader of the top, um, best of luck for this coming year. You and your AI candidates. Thank you. Thanks very much Thanks for your for time. Thanks for having me.